Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue feasting up upon your word together. We are so keenly aware of just how little we know. I just ask that you would filter out all of that nonsense, everything that is not of you, but just seal to our hearts that precious truth that we need to grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and we're going to continue on in our study here in Revelation. This will be part 18. Uh, we're looking at the beginning of God's wrath after the church is gone. And so we started out looking at uh, the first rider uh, on, the, on the white horse in the last video and I expressed my, my great uh, desire that this be Christ, not the Antichrist. Uh, I'd like to take the writer, the first writer here as Christ. There's nothing I would rather do more than to, than to see this as Christ, who is the beginning and the end. He begins this. He kicks this whole thing off. He begins this. We see him again in Revelation chapter 19, returning on a white horse, faithful and true, the one who uh, is God Almighty, God in the flesh, uh, that he oversees everything that's, that's about to take place. And so we're being introduced to Christ right at the beginning of the opening of the first seal. But my experience as a Bible teacher won't allow me to do that. As much as it may appear to be Christ, I believe that that would be pushing the text. It would be prejudicing the text. It would be reading into the text uh, a preconceived idea in which the, the biblical, the scriptural, the, the contextual support is, uh, for the most part, just ignored. In short, it would, it would be what we call eisegesis. It's, uh, well, I, I would like for it to be Christ, so I'm going to try in every way I can to make this fit Christ. Kind of like trying to make a pair of shoes fit, you know, uh, your feet when, uh, when they just won't fit. I would argue, and, and I'm going to at this point, I believe that we are simply looking at all the evidence seems to lean toward the fact that this is the Antichrist after we are gone, who arrives on the scene peacefully at first. He doesn't have a sign on his back saying, I'm the Antichrist. And uh, wh whose disguise and, and his victory is short-lived. The bow with no arrows, possibly representing a, a period in which the Antichrist is really not going around killing everybody. He's not being destructive, not at first. But as we continue on and we see these seals opened and these events unfold, we see that uh, that's going to change. And I have come to the conclusion, and I don't ask anyone to agree with me here. Uh, in fact, I don't ask you to agree with me on anything. I, I uh, implore you to take and search these scriptures to see if these things be so. We can spend a lot of time in this book, folks. And I believe the Lord will honor that time that we've spent in this book. And He will reveal the truth of His Word to us. Of that, I have no doubt. I believe that the more time we spend in it, the more clearer the picture becomes. But we also, at the same time, we have to caution ourselves about uh, not reading uh, uh, things such as the coronavirus and things like that into this. We are just not at that point yet. The church is still here. We're looking at the church in heaven, primarily, uh, first and foremost, we've already left. Uh, we're in heaven, 
and and it is only then that that the seals are the uh, the scroll is unrolled and the seals are open uh, and uh, we can easily take words you know uh, well crown means you know coronavirus and uh, I'm not going to fault anybody for for taking that view it's just that when we th when, when you really stop and you think that through that's uh, uh, to me that just doesn't work that's that's it's sloppy exegesis. So I say that lovingly, uh, and and so we're we're looking at the bow with no arrows, which I believe represents a a, a period, a short period. I don't know how long, in which the Antichrist is is not seen as the Antichrist, and he's not performing or functioning in a destructive way. But that's going to change. And I've I've come pretty much to the conclusion that the whole book uh, consists of, uh, well, mostly the whole book of Revelation, it consists of a triple series of visions which prefigure future events that parallel one another. This is not, well, all the seals are events and then all the trumpets are events and then all the, the bowl or the vile judgments are events and they all follow in succession uh, it's uh, that's not how I see this. Now that may be your view, but that's not the view of this ministry. Uh, so they prefigure future events that parallel one another. Okay, each leading to the consummation of all things. Uh, it it it's it can be a tough study, and I understand that. And and uh, but I don't want you to be, you folks, to be discouraged in thinking that well, you just I've got to be a Bible scholar to understand these things. I, you know, I remember back in fifth grade, quite some time ago, where the teacher taught the whole class to kiss. He said he was going to teach everybody to kiss that day, and of course, all the little girls they giggled and. And, and the guys kind of sat around looking a little, a little bewildered, and and it was the whole idea was keep it simple, stupid. You know the. I think that that rule would well apply here. I think we need to keep it simple, uh, not really go off the deep end, in trying to uh, uh, force any anything into the text. Just allow the text to speak for itself. This is what God has said. Uh, we may not fully understand it, but these are the things that He said. And I think that, that we can all do that. Uh, so, the opening of the seventh seal actually being the beginning of a new, a new symbolical representation which go, going over the same ground but under the vision of the trumpets and the vile judgments in it, as well being a, a new point of view. Okay, so they're different points of view. The whole is therefore, I believe, completed it, it, with, and please don't misunderstand me here, we're not by any means done uh, by the end of the six seals, but the, the whole is therefore completed with the six seals. The seals being a brief overview. John is given right at the beginning a brief overview of everything, but it doesn't fully describe or fully explain everything. It, it's just a brief overview. And that's how I'm looking at that. So he's now given the period in review once more to behold new visions which are expressed more fully, okay, which actually complement what the visions of the seals have in brief revealed. That's how I'm seeing this. The uh, this series of signs uh, or seals it, it, it concludes not with a, a, a catastrophe at seal 7 but w it concludes with silence. After the seventh trumpet in Revelation uh, 
11, I believe. Uh, I believe it's chapter 11. Uh, yeah, it's chapter 11, I think verse somewhere around verse 15. Uh, yeah, it's chapter 11. The uh, After that seventh trumpet in Revelation 11, we hear voices again. There's, there's silence at the opening of the seventh seal. And uh, the events that are, are symbolized by these seven trumpets appear to describe events in the Great Tribulation period. Okay. Uh, simply, what I'm simply saying is that the seven trumpet judgments appear, at least to me, to be all referring to events which unfold during the second half of the tribulation, the great tribulation, whereas the the uh, the six seals, uh, the seal, uh, are the the uh, yeah. The seal judgments, the opening of the, the, the six seals is a, is a brief overview of the entire seven-year period. That's, that's the way I'm seeing that. Now, the use of the scales, the uh, balances here as a symbol, to me, that would signify that something was uh, to be accurately, carefully weighed out. Uh, I, th I believe most Bible expositors they they look at this and and they they take that as well. That's most definitely has that most definitely that has to do with with commerce and the economy and uh, the the careful uh, dis distribution of rations uh, that sort of thing. Uh, it's carefully weighed out. Uh, if you turn over to the twelfth chapter of Hosea, we see, we read, "He is a merchant; the balances uh, of deceit are in his hand. He loves to oppress." In Proverbs chapter eleven, dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but an accurate weight is his delight. Okay, and it says that the oil and the wine were to be spared. Now, you could take that as, well, those aren't necessities. You know, uh, you know wheat uh, or, you know, a loaf of bread could cost $5, but, you know, your cable TV bill's not going to go up, okay? I, I mean, you can look at it that way. The oil, don't, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the text says that the oil and wine were to be spared. You know, because they're not necessities. Or it could mean a restraint on the rider of the horse who would injure the, the spiritual oil and wine. That is, he's not yet allowed to prohibit true worship here at this point, which uh, is what I think the text is saying. Now, that's just my own personal personal belief there and uh, I'm seeing the word animals or beasts uh, where that uh, men are killed by beasts uh, uh, I've often in the past I've thought of that you know as, as a result of depopulation uh, and migration of uh, relocation of animals uh, wild beasts which kill humans uh, so I, I looked at the, the beasts uh, in a in a natural, uh, uh, just, you know, animal context. I'm not so sure that that's what the text is saying. Uh, I'm seeing the word animals or beasts in, here in a, in a human context. Evil, brutal men. The word in the Greek can mean that. In fact, it often does mean that. And because the word is used in that sense... I believe it more properly fits the context. Rather, rather than men being killed by animals due to population reduction or, or whatever, or displacement or chaos or whatever, I believe that the suspension 
of uh, winds here also, uh, or cessation of winds, where the angels hold back the winds uh, from the north, east, south, and west, uh, is rel related to the sealing of the servants of God. So it's a period of calm in which the servants of God are sealed. So that's how I'm looking at that. Now I've done a number of videos. If you, if you follow this channel, you know that I've done a lot of videos. Well, not maybe not a lot, but I've done quite a few videos on, on uh, giving you my position, my interpretation, my understanding of the end time beast system and uh, who that pertains to, uh, what what all is involved in that beast system, and and, and how I, I would uh, I've shared with you folks my my take on that, uh, the identification of that beast system, and uh, I don't want YouTube to be flagging these videos uh, because they're so politically incorrect uh, that that uh, you can't uh, any any long you, you can no longer watch this channel or that I have to move to Vivo or I have to move to uh, Rumble or, or, or something uh, it's uh, and I know they have algorithm Google has algorithms that pick up on certain keywords and stuff uh, but uh, and I don't want that happening but I don't know how to, to, to talk to you about this subject without just going ahead and, and, and reminding you of the fact that uh, I believe that that, and I have always believed that that in Christ, that, that, that in time antichrist beast system is not uh, uh, there's I don't I don't hold I don't take to the majority view on that the popular view the popular view is or some of the mo more popular views is that is well it's the it's the uh, the papal system the Roman Catholic papal system uh, or it's a it's the new it's the United Nations or New World Order sort of thing the globalist kind of thing uh, it's uh, to me none of that has ever fit the context very well I believe it's religious in nature it's it's Christianity has a counterfeit I've mentioned what religion that that is and I believe that that is exactly what we're looking at here so uh, and I believe that speaks uh, volumes to the word uh, beast there uh, or that it's it, I believe it's speaking of evil brutal men <coughs> so uh, a brief summary of of this of of the seven year period is is how I would look at these seals and so uh, in the first half if if you really look closely at these the opening of these seals we see that the antichrist arrives i believe that he ha is he he does uh stand in, uh, behind or in support of a world religion and i believe you know who i'm what that i believe most of you out there who watch this channel you know what religion i'm talking about and peace is taken from the earth uh, just look at uh, what if Christianity was to suddenly depart. Look at uh, just do a simple Google search and look at what the the largest world religion would would then be. And you see death, you see economic depression, you see war, you see famine, and you see death by these beasts. And then you see saints martyred at the fifth seal. Fifth seal, saints martyred. Which I believe is the midpoint or, or the, the bridge which bridges the two halves okay, to the great tribulation period. 
Uh, in the second half, we see earthquakes, we see cosmic disturbance, we see nuclear, what I believe is nuclear winter, uh, possibly even a polar shift. I don't see how that that could be any, the, far, the stars falling from the heavens can be anything other than that. We see the elite, uh, or no, I, I take that back, it's not the elite. We see all men, both great and small, everyone taking refuge underground. Now, it's the last place that I would want to be, I think, myself, if I was in that, in that predicament and I saw all this, this taking place. But that's what they do. They take refuge underground. They would rather die than face God at that point. Of course, they're going to face God when they die anyway. But at that point, they would rather face death than face God. And there is a most definitely an expectation of God's wrath. They know what's, what's happening. And they would rather die than face God. In chapter 7, the second half, if you look, it is continued. There's no wind. God's servants are sealed. Uh, we, we see the redemption of God's people. And as we move on over to chapter 8, the seventh seal. Now, now we come to the seventh seal. And there is silence for half an hour. Silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And the prayers and, or the worship of the saints are combined, mixed with, combined with fire from the altar and an angel hurls that upon the earth. Uh, and what follows then is the trumpet judgments. So I want to talk a little bit about the silence in heaven and give you my position on that. Now if you look at the, the trumpet judgments, they appear to be mostly uh, just a casual reading will show you that they're mostly celestial or, or cosmic in nature or, or caused by it. But as it regards this silence, I am persuaded strongly, in fact, that this refers back to since things mirror on earth, mirror that which is in heaven. This refers back to the incense and the worship of God in the temple, which used to be offered uh, before the morning and after the evening sacrifice. And while the sacrifices were made, if you go back to Chronicles, Second Chronicles, you'll see that, that uh, while these sacrifices were made, the voices and the instruments and the trumpets sounded, but, but, while the priest went into the temple to burn incense, everyone was silent. And the people prayed without. They, they weren't able to go inside the temple. They, so they prayed without the temple, outside the temple, in silence or to themselves. Now, what's interesting about this is if you just go to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. And what we see that was is that in the days of Herod, okay, there was a certain priest, okay, priest, underlined priest, and his name was Zacharias. Now, most of you know the story. There, Zacharias, uh, he had a wife. His wife was named, named Elizabeth. And... Uh, they, were, uh, they walked blameless before God. Uh, they didn't have a child. Elizabeth was barren. Um, but, uh, and it came to pass that while Zacharias was, was performing his duties as priest, okay, uh, his, his job was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Okay? And the whole multitude of the people were outside praying at the time of that burning of that incense. Now, this 
it's amazing how much this mirrors the silence in heaven that we're, we're looking at here in our study. Uh, if, uh, if we go over to jump ahead, and I hate doing that, but if we jump ahead to Revelation chapter 8, uh, we see that they're uh, an angel of the Lord, okay, uh, is standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Uh, there's it, the parallel, folks, is striking. Uh, if, if you if you go back to Luke and you, you see that there there appears an angel of the Lord, okay, and and when Zachariah saw this angel, he he became afraid. But the angel said, "Don't don't be afraid." God's heard your prayer, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear a son, and thou shalt call his name John. John. Now, that's not the John of the writer of this what of Revelation here. That's John the Baptist. Many of you understand that. So don't get confused there. Looking at John the Baptist, and that is, that is I believe, a, a very, very key in un to understanding what's going on here. Uh, John the Baptist. Folks, it is important that you get down, get this down pat, okay? Christ arrives on the scene. Jesus arrives on the scene. Offering the kingdom as well as himself as king to his people Israel. That was the message. That was the gospel. The, the, the kingdom of God has arrived. Of course, we know that God's people, Israel, rejected both the kingdom as well as it, her, her king. And God set Israel aside so that salvation could come to the Gentiles. The church was a mystery in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, it was a mystery even to Jesus' disciples. Many of you, I know, understand that dispensational distinction that at that dispensational aspect of that uh, Matthew 24 describes the tribulation period we're looking at we can go right to Matthew 24 after the church is seen in heaven it continues on the church was a parenthesis it, uh, you need to you need to understand that okay it was a mystery and so what is it when the church is gone and we're in heaven, what is it? What's the gospel that's going to be preached? Beginning with the two witnesses, the 144,000 uh, that that spreads across the globe, where that uh, this generation won't pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Is it the gospel that we preach? No. It is the good news of the coming kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. It is the same gospel that the, the two witnesses, folks, preach the same gospel John the Baptist preached. Same gospel. This angel tells Zacharias, you'll, have, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll just be thrilled to death, you know, that you'll rejoice it at his birth because. He'll be great in the sight of God and uh, he'll be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And, and many of the children of Israel shall he, John the Baptist, turn to the Lord their God. He'll go before them in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Okay. All right. Are you getting the connection here? I hope I hope you are. Uh, because what we're looking at is, you know, it's it's, you know, the 
when, when the Israelites built the earthly temple, it mirrored the, the, what was the, the heavenly temple. It was a shadow of that. What we're looking at here with the silence in heaven is, is we're looking at the real thing here, the, you know, on the spiritual side of everything. And uh, there are redeemed with the, God's people, the redeemed, the, those that, that are sealed, uh, uh, as well as those who are martyred, you know, those that are God's people who are to be saved or redeemed within that period, known as the Daniel's 70th week, they are of utmost importance. They are of major concern both to God as well as to us, the angels, those who... The, the whole picture of what you see here taking place. Folks, listen to me. Uh, contrary to the popular idea that, you know, that when we die we go off to that great hunting ground with our, our coon dog, you know, in, in the sky, our best rabbit hounds or whatever, or, or we're on that beautiful lake, you know, with the, the, the nicest bass boat, that, you know, where that you're catching a fish every time you cast or, or golfing and you're making a hole in one every time you, you hit the ball, you know, whatever your fancy, you know, is. Any, any common sense thinking Christian knows that that's not, the, that's, not what, that's not the picture that we're looking at. Now, I have no idea what's going to come when all of this is, is in, in Revelation chapter 23. Okay? But what I, I, I do believe that God will delight in fulfilling the desires of our heart, but at this point, our concern is for our brethren. It's not over. Just because we've been raptured, it's not over. Just, just as we have a concern for our brethren here now, we will have a concern for our brethren then. I want you to note what these trumpet judgments describe. Okay? If you start at, at the first trumpet, there's hail, fire, blood, a third of the trees, all grass burn up. Now, I mean, to me, that appears to describe meteorite impacts. The second trumpet is obviously an asteroid impact in the sea. Uh, it might even possibly be a volcanic eruption as well. One third of the sea. Uh, to, turns to blood, a third of the sea life, a third of the ships destroyed. Well, uh, you got the third trumpet, an asteroid land impact. That's where a third of the waters become undrinkable that results in massive uh, death. The fourth trumpet is a, a third of the earth is darkened by atmospheric debris. Well, we know that those asteroid impacts would throw up that debris into the atmosphere. And, and, and then it's saying, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And we go to chapter 9, the fifth trumpet, Satan or, or, or some mighty demon is cast to earth with the ability to release demonic forces, the army of locusts. Uh, to me, that, that likely represents uh, militant... is. Uh, uh, Antichrist forces in the hands of Satan to torment and yet not kill. Uh, uh, they, they're not allowed to kill the ungodly, the ungodly, uh, under this fifth trumpet. The sealed are protected from harm. The sixth trumpet, I think we may be looking at sudden nuclear uh, holocaust. And, and despite all this, the survivors are unrepentant, okay? But you, you can't, I personally, I can't help but see all that as the second half. So again, I believe we're, we're given a, a brief overview of the seven years with the six seals. And then the seventh introduces, seventh seal introduces the seven trumpets, which are pretty much, to me, at least in my opinion, they describe the events events during the great tribulation period 
we get to chapter 10, we see God's wrath uh, it, which in which they've been given opportunity to repent. Uh, uh, that that time that He's given them uh, to repent is exhausted, and you know there there appears to be a limit to God's patience here. Uh, the allotted time having been run, there's no more delay. The last final trumpet judgment marking the end of time, and the beginning uh, of of everything for the redeemed and then we see in chapter 11 it, it actually and this is what's interesting we get to chapter 11 it actually reverts back to the first half for a brief period the first half of the tribulation period because it mentions the two witnesses killed and uh or the midpoint at least uh, where that they're killed and they're raised uh, these two witnesses who uh, called down judgments on earth upon earth uh, followed by an earthquake and death. So chapter 11 it's is back to the first half of the tribulation period and uh, which is followed then by the, our most familiar chapter, chapter 12, which uh, I'm going to have quite a bit to say about that as we go on. Look, I'm out of time. I want to say just how much I love you all. I truly do. I hope everyone is staying safe. Uh, they're still working on me. I'll, I'll know more about the, uh, these other test results at a, fu uh, a future date. I want to thank you so much for all of your prayers, your love, your messages of support. Follow us on me. We uh, uh, rest in Him, folks. Uh, time's growing short. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.